than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you are a God who is building a house for your name, wherein dwells your glory. And I pray, Father, as we consider the great superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that we would give him preeminence in our midst as an assembly and in our lives individually, that, Lord, you have purposed that Jesus Christ should have that name which is above every name. It is pleasing to you that the Lord Jesus Christ should be in that place of preeminence. And Father, we confess that it's a, a growing process for, under, for us to understand how we hold back in so many ways from giving Jesus Christ that first place in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that thy spirit would open our eyes to see, to see our hearts the way you see them, to see the truth in the word of God as you have given it. And then, Father, enabled by thy presence, may we go forward growing changing ever into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, ever giving him first place in our hearts. We look to you now with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. As we return to our study in the book of Hebrews, we're reminded that as we opened up chapter 3, the writer of Hebrews presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the apostle as well as the high priest of our confession. He's writing to believers, and we're not going to get to uh, the second warning passage that begins in verse 7, but really the thought of the warning passage opens up in verse 6. But we'll look at that next week when Paul speaks about if we hold fast our confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And if we don't get to it next week, if Jesus Christ comes today, wouldn't that be glory? you'll understand it like you never understood it before. Better than I can even present it, but we'll look at it, Lord willing, next week. The Lord Jesus Christ here is presented to the Jewish believers. He's writing to believers, we saw earlier in our study in verse 1, when he says, holy brethren, not just brethren, meaning Jews, but holy brethren, Hebrews 3.1. Notice, partakers of the heavenly calling. That phrase is going to come up again, we'll see in our study. And so he's writing to those who have named the name of Jesus Christ. We see that when he uses the word, Jesus is the high priest of our confession. That is a verbal pronouncement of our faith in Jesus Christ. We confess that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, that he died for my sins. And then, of course, we confess him as Lord. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all, is a true saying. But it truly is a process of growth spiritually to allow Jesus Christ to have that place of lordship in our life. May God help us to let him have more preeminence in our hearts each and every day. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Lord, and we who have confessed our faith and trust in him, then this message that was written to these Hebrew believers, we will see is very, very relevant to us today. The writer of Hebrews takes up in verse 3 now the second realm of comparison. The first realm was all throughout Hebrews chapter 1, and that Jesus is greater than the angels. And we've looked at that. But now the writer of Hebrews is taking up Jesus is also greater than Moses. Now this is something that to the Gentile listener today, and when I say Gentile, we're no longer Gentiles. If you've trusted in Christ, if you've made a confession of faith in him, uh, as Jesus Christ is your savior, you're born again. You're a child of God. We're a new creation in Christ. But if you came out of a Gentile background, not a Jewish background, this sounds odd to us why someone would compare Jesus Christ to Moses and present him as far superior to Moses. But that's because we often don't look at the scriptures in the context of which they are given. To the Jewish people, their history of Moses is very real, very prominent, and very important. And so it should be 
The first five books of our Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, were written by Moses. As we will see today, he was used as the servant of the Lord to give the law to his people Israel. And I don't need to look further for an illustration of the reality of this than my own lifetime when Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, a couple of years ago, addressed our own Congress of the United States and he pointed to a statue of Moses in the background. Because the United States of America was built upon the Judeo-Christian ethic as well. A belief in the morality and the truths that are revealed in the word of God. And of course the nation of Israel and the United States find in our faith some similarities where in the word of God. That's what Benjamin Netanyahu was pointing out. You, at least we used to, embrace the Ten Commandments just like the people of Israel do. Who did God use as a servant to give those Ten Commandments? Well, God spoke them, but it was Moses who came down from the mountain with the two tablets to give to the people God's law. And so for the people of Israel, Moses has always been a tremendous figure. And in the first century, they looked up to and revered Moses as a great spiritual leader, a servant of the Lord. And the writer of Hebrews now wants to challenge their understanding if they should put Moses in the preeminent place because that is not the preeminent place. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And he presents three reasons why here. The first reason that Jesus is preeminent is because Jesus is the builder of the house. Moses is not the builder of a house, but Jesus is the builder of the house. And the writer of Hebrews says the builder of the house deserves more glory than the servant who served in the house. We'll see that this morning. But then also he presents that Jesus is greater than Moses because he is faithful. Please notice now in verse 6, Christ is a son over his own house. We're going to see this morning that in these first six verses of chapter 3, there's actually two houses that are being spoken of here. Moses was a servant in God's house in the Old Testament. But now Jesus is the son. He's over his own house. That's very interesting. There are two houses that are presented in these six verses. We'll see that this morning as well. So Jesus is worthy of more glory because he was faithful. Moses was faithful in the house of God as a servant. Jesus is faithful as the builder of the house, and he's faithful in his ministry and working out of his ministry in that house that he has built. And then thirdly, one point that we won't take as much time, we really won't be looking at this this morning, but the writer of the Hebrews points out that Moses was a servant, verse 5, but Jesus Christ is the Son of God, verse 6. And so he's worthy of greater glory because he's the Son. And that's the subject of the entire presentation in chapter 1. It is the Son of God who spoke. And it is now the Son of God who came and died for our sins. It is the Son of God who's risen. After he arose from the dead, he's risen to the right hand of the Father. And he is worthy of more glory. What we want to see today, of course, is Jesus then is worthy of all our praise and adoration. The Lord Jesus Christ should have the place of preeminence in all our praise. That's the root meaning of the word glory as we see it here in verse 3. He's worthy of more glory than Moses. We want to understand that Jesus Christ is worthy of all glory, all praise in our hearts for God's children. And there's coming a day, we've already seen it, when every knee shall bow, whether they've confessed faith in Jesus Christ or not. There's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, why is Jesus worthy of all our praise and adoration? We've already seen it in those three principles. Let's take the first one up. Jesus is worthy of our praise because he is, present tense, building, and please notice in verse 6, his own house. His own house. The word house comes up six times here. I'm sorry, seven times in these first six verses. And as I mentioned, there are two houses. God built a house in the Old Testament, and he used his mo servant Moses in the building of that house as a servant as he served the Lord while God built his house. Now God is building another house, and that house is being built by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he, the apostle, 
and high priest of our confession is the one who is also faithfully serving in his house. Now the quote here that we have in verse 5, Moses was indeed faithful in all his house as a servant, comes from the book of Numbers, and it comes from Numbers chapter 12 and verse 7. We're going to go there in just a minute. And uh, I, I, wrote, I liked how the New King James helps us by capitalizing the pronoun his. Notice it says here, he, uh, in, in verse, what verse did I just read? <laughs> his house, in verse 3, Moses was also faithful in all his house. And uh, we also saw it in verse 5. That's why I got lost. It's two times the quote comes up. Moses was indeed faithful in all his house. Notice that the word his both times is capitalized. That's reminding us, that's showing us that it's speaking to deity, God. Now, that's important. Some people, with if you don't have these pronouns capitalized, it's easy to confuse that. Some people come away with the thinking that Moses was building his own house. But if you just took the time, let's go there now to back to Numbers chapter 12. You'll see that is not the case at all. It is proper to capitalize that pronoun his. Numbers chapter 12. Now, we've been looking at the book of Numbers. We still are in our Wednesday night prayer meetings. And so we just were looking at this chapter together. It's a a dark chapter. This is a chapter on rebellion that took place in the nation of Israel. And here the rebellion is coming from none other than Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses, and Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Moses, both of them older than Moses. And in this context, when they spoke against Moses, we're told in verse 2 that the Lord heard it. And when God, by the way, that, that is a very penetrating truth, is it not? We cannot say anything but that God altogether hears and knows what we've said. God knows the very thoughts and intents of our heart. When Aaron and Miriam spoke against Moses, we're told in verse 2, the Lord heard it and he called them out, verse 4. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. And so the three came out. Listen, when God calls you out, you come. And the Lord called them out. And notice what God says, beginning in verse 6 to Aaron and Miriam. Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. Now notice, here's the quote. He is faithful in all my house. This is God's house that Moses is faithful in. So... Uh, we have to be careful to understand that the writer of Hebrews, when he talks about Moses building this house, he's building God's house. But what's appropriate is he's being used of God to build his house. Now, anytime we hear this word, house, it just means dwelling, just means a habitation. We immediately think of, of course, the tabernacle, do we not? And that's the scene right here. As I told you, God called Moses, Aaron, and Miriam out to the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was right in the center of the camp. The Levites were camped immediately around it. And then all the tribes were camped in their tents around that. And so the whole nation of Israel was around the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is the place, of course, where God was manifesting his presence. It's where Aaron now and his sons were bringing the sacrifices. And God manifested his glory there in the tabernacle and over the tabernacle as he met with his people. So rightfully so, when we hear that word house, we think of the tabernacle. That's the setting. But I believe the word has a little bit broader sense than that. Because God is not only speaking of the tabernacle, but he's speaking of his nation Israel, who were encamped all around that tabernacle because Moses was not only involved in the instructions that he received on Mount Sinai to build that tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40 tells us he carried that out faithfully and after uh, the gifted artisans produced all the articles whether it was the furniture or the priestly garments the coverings and the boards and the sockets and the uh, uh, beams all of it Moses then put it all together, Exodus chapter 40, and then God brought forth his presence there in the midst of his people 
Israel. And so this word house, I believe, is used because it's a little bit broader than just the tabernacle. That certainly is in view, but God is speaking about his nation, his people, Israel. Look with me at Exodus chapter 25, since you're close. Notice Exodus chapter 25, when the Lord brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and led them, Moses, the mediator, led them to Mount Sinai, God declared what he was going to do and gave Moses instructions of how specifically in details and told Moses to follow the pattern of those details that he gave to Moses. And why was the Lord doing that? Notice in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, when God was speaking uh, about the uh, offerings that they were to bring and the altar, and then he was going to talk about all the uh, priestly garments, and then in verse 10 and following, the ark of the testimony, whereon would lie the mercy seat. Notice in verses 8 and 9, God said, And let them make me a sanctuary, that's the tabernacle, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern and of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Why? Verse 8, God says, I'm going to dwell in the midst of my people. This is amazing. We're, we're now going to see God desiring to use the nation of Israel, his people, as a testimony to all the Gentiles around them who are worshiping false idols, worshiping the sun, worshiping the planets and the stars, worshiping even the creatures, all this false idolatry. In the midst of that, God now is building his people, the nation of Israel. And in the midst of his people is the tabernacle. This is the one, the true, the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, and he dwells in the midst of his people, not some temple up on the hill or prominently set in a city wherein lies a statue. No, a humble tabernacle is what God gave to the people of Israel with coverings. They called it a tent, but it was no humble place when you understood who it was who was dwelling and manifesting his presence by his glory. Here was the very glory of God, and he dwelt in the midst of his people. That's what God wanted to do. And so Israel was his house. They were to be his witness to all the Gentile nations. There is only one God. You can't see him. He's manifesting his presence in our midst. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's the one, the true, the living God. And so Israel was to be God's house. Now later on, as you know, after they were in the promised land, uh, it was David who after the tabernacle had sadly been conquered by the Philistines and ravaged and uh, things split up because of they were conquered. Why? Well, the book of Judges tells us the people of Israel got away from their whole understanding and purpose of what the tabernacle was supposed to be all about. They lost the sense of the presence of God in their midst. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, without God's instructions on their own ideas, thought, we'll take the Ark of the Covenant out to battle. You know, that was like taking a good luck charm is really what that was like. God didn't tell them to do that. I'm, I understand their thinking, by the way. Their thinking was probably like Joshua in days of old. They marched around the city of Jericho with the Ark of the Covenant. What was the difference between Joshua and the people of Israel marching around Jericho and Hophni and Phinehas marching out the Ark of the Covenant to battle against the Philistines? The answer is this, God's word. The difference was God told Joshua to do that. God never told Hophni and Phinehas to do it. They took it out as if it was some magical instrument. They were so far from understanding who God is. And that shows up in the way they lived, by the way, the immorality of their lives. No, God didn't tell them to take that out there, and God allowed his people to suffer, suffer a gross defeat at the hand of their enemies. Why? Because they lost their faith and trust in God. They weren't following him and his word. They were doing whatever they wanted to do, which, by the way, you know it well, they did what seemed right to them in their own eyes. It seems right to us. seems like a good thing to do. I mean, God's our God, right? And he'll win our battles for us. <laughs> God is looking for a heart that is in faith obedient to him. That's what God's looking for. And God has worked unspeakable wonders 
in the believing heart. But that's not where Israel was at that time. But David had a different heart, didn't he? David said, we need to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. But David was a man who was listening to God because God sent his prophet to say, no, no, David, you will not be the one. But David's desire was right. God said it will be your son, and it was Solomon who built the temple. And why? Because God purposed to dwell in the midst of his people, just like we read here in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. What is the house, the house of God, Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, that is referred to in the book of Hebrews? It is none other than the nation of Israel in whom they were wonderfully privileged to have the temple, earlier the tabernacle, wherein God manifested his glory. In the first century, when the nation of Israel was once again in a bad place, like you read about in the Old Testament, where did the Lord Jesus Christ go? To the temple. Now, this was a rebuilt temple, uh, a temple that was rebuilt, and Herod, of course, wicked Herod, was the one who beautified it and adding to it. But in that rebuilt temple, Jesus went there. And what did he say to the people of Israel? Jesus said, my house, God said in his Old Testament, shall be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Israel was to be God's house. And I'm going back to Hebrews now, if you want to join me, Hebrews chapter 3. And God used Moses as a servant to give his truth, his law, and, and reveal to his people Israel all that he wanted to accomplish in and through them to make his name, God's name, God's testimony, God's glory known among all the nations. And Moses was faithful. Moses was faithful, and, uh, and God used him in a mighty way. But now, in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 3, Christ, Jesus Christ, as a son over his own house, now notice these words, whose house we are. Whose house we are. Who is the house of God that Jesus Christ is building that he is personally claiming as his own house? Ah, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said something very different recorded in Matthew chapter 16, didn't he? In the midst of all the rejection of the people of Israel to whom Jesus Christ came, he said to his disciples, let's turn there. Matthew chapter 16, you've got to see it. When you, when you see it in the light of what the writer of Hebrews is saying, it's going to help us to appreciate the argument he's making to these people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Jewish believers, but are now tempted to turn back and turn away from Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples. And verse 13 of Matthew 16, when the Lord Jesus Christ came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so the disciples gave him the honest answer. You know it. Verse 14, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, meaning uh, he was risen from the dead. Some say Jeremiah, meaning he was risen from the dead or one of the prophets. In other words, the people of Israel recognized that Jesus was clearly a spokesperson for God. He spoke the word of God. You couldn't miss that if you heard Jesus Christ. You read the Gospels and you just sense the truth of God taught by the Son of God. And the people recognized that, but they didn't go any further than that. They assumed he was just some prophet. One of the prophets. Maybe Jeremiah or an Elijah or someone like that. And the Lord Jesus Christ then turned the question to those who did believe in him. Those who did profess. And that comes straight forward from the lips of none other than Peter. In verse 15, when Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. That is the Messiah, the anointed one. You are the Christ, the Son of of the living God, there's faith. To the ones who believed in him and received him, what did Jesus now say? Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so the Lord Jesus Christ builds on Peter's profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Who are you? You are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who came 
And, uh, and, and the Lord built on that saying what? I'm now going to do some building of my own. Did you notice that verse 18 is in the future tense? That's what I want to point out to you. There, and I want to point that out because there are some who say there's only one house of God. There are Christians who just say there's one house of God. The Saint Moses and believers today are all part of the one house of God. That's not what the scriptures present. God has two houses. God built a house of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, and he gave them the tabernacle. He gave them his law. He gave them the sacrifices. And we're going to see in Hebrews chapter 3 that these were all to point forward to something greater. God was going to send his son, Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will, future tense, build my church. I will build my church. The word church is the word in the Greek ekklesia, which means an assembly. It means those who are called out, they gather together to do what? To proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ. This is a future building. And the Lord Jesus Christ began to build this church after he ascended to heaven. And so, go back to Hebrews now, chapter 3. The writer of Hebrews is reminding these Jewish believers of these glorious truths that they might see the greater position of honor, glory, even preeminence that God the Father is giving to his son, Jesus Christ, who is building his own house. What is that house? It's the church, the church. And the church is called a building. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. You can turn there if you want to. Some, if you feel like I'm turning to too many passages, just write them down and take a note of these. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and following, Paul is addressing the believers in a local assembly in Corinth, a very Gentile city. Now, there were still a lot of Jewish believers in that city as well. And Paul writes to say that God takes them, Jew or Gentile, once you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you become one in Christ. It's no longer Jew believer, Gentile believer. We're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians chapter 4. Why? God is building his church, the ecclesia. And Paul speaks about that when he talks about some men that the believers in Corinth were struggling with. They were struggling with associating with one teacher more than another. Some associated with Paul, of course. He's the one who brought the gospel to Corinth in the beginning. But then there was another eloquent proclaimer of the Old Testament scriptures, Apollos. And, and there was division within the assembly. And Paul says in verse 5, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? We're both just servants. The word minister is servant. Just like Moses, Paul and Apollos are just servants through whom you believed, notice, as the Lord gave to each one. As the Lord gave to each one. He goes on to say in verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered. They were servants. They were involved in preaching the gospel, proclaiming the truth. But who's the one who gives the increase? God the Lord gave the increase, verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now notice verse 9. Paul writes, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's what? Building. Building. And this is Christ's own house. Now when we think of the church, and we think of the church as a building, What's in mind? Well, the same concept that we saw with the Old Testament house, the nation of Israel. What was in the very center of the encampment of the children of Israel? It was the tabernacle. Because God manifested his glory there in the midst of his people. And that's what God wanted to proclaim to all the nations. God in all his glory, the living and true God. Well, guess what? Look at verses 16 and 17. Paul writes to the believers of Corinth, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. The temple is the whole concept we usually have when we think of the building of God. What's the building of God? That's true. It's the place where God dwells and manifests his presence. But the picture here is not of a physical building, is it? No, no. In the New Testament, believers are being built together as living stones. And that's according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. 
as a holy temple according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Why? Same thing that Paul states here. The Spirit of God is dwelling in the midst of his people. To do what? To make known the glory of God. Now, how are we making known the glory of God? The answer is by making known the builder of this house, the church, the body of Christ. Who's the builder of this house? Well, it's the same builder as in the Old Testament, but it's a different house. It's the church. It's the body of Christ. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3. If you don't get that straight, and if you don't have that fixed in your understanding, the change, God's house Israel, and then the house of God, which is the church, the body of Christ, and that they're two separate houses, I guarantee you are struggling with understanding how the Old Testament and New Testament fit together. God did a glorious program with the nation of Israel, and sadly, they didn't understand it. They let it go, and they lost it. God is doing a glorious program with his church, the body of Christ. I'm not going to ask you to forgive me. But sadly, we miss it. And we don't value it. We don't comprehend it. And we don't understand. What do I mean? Well, to us today, the church is all about me. It's all about me. I mean, I go to this church because that's my church. I like this church. No, no. Whose church is it? It's God's church. The Lord Jesus Christ. This is his assembly. When God uses the figure of the body of Christ, he says Jesus is the head. When the Lord speaks of the church, what does he say? Well, I didn't read it, but we heard it earlier. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. He's the foundation of this church. Whose glory is in the church? The glory of the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is is building his church today to make the glory of his risen son, Jesus Christ, known to a lost and a dying world. And I want to tell you, that's lost on a lot of believers today. Church is something that I like, something I go there because, well, I like the color pews they have, you know. I'm being facetious. I can easily put my finger right on the pulsating nerves of the things that we put first but I don't want to take the place of the Spirit of God in your heart. What is it in my heart that I am putting first that is not allowing Jesus Christ to have his will and his way in my life? And I want to tell you, even in the company of believers, when we don't allow Jesus Christ to have first place in our hearts, he loses first place in his assembly. And the assembly just becomes another place to get people out. I mean, it's wonderful. We can have all these ministries, which are good. They can be wonderful ministries and used by God. But if the ministries are about me and for me, we've lost our very purpose to make known the glory of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a second house in this passage. And that house is the church, the body of Christ, God is building together believers as a living temple wherein dwells the living Holy Spirit of God to manifest the glory of God to a lost and a dying world. Now, there's one more point here in Hebrews chapter 3, if you got your way back. Even as Moses was faithful, we see in verse 5, even so, verse 6, the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful as a son over his house. He's faithful to the Lord. Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ has been and is and will always be faithful? Thank you, God. Thank you. The Lord Jesus Christ was faithful to come to this earth and go to the cruel cross of Calvary, even though he had to face death. Think of it. The living God who created mankind then became a man and went to the cross to die for our sins. We read about it in the Gospels in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus Christ was faithful and he said, Not my will, thy will be done. And the Lord Jesus Christ now is presented in Hebrews 3 as a faithful high priest. It opens up in chapter 2, verse 17. We're told that in all things, he, the Son, Jesus Christ, had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest and things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Meaning, the Lord Jesus Christ continues to be faithful as he is available 
to his children. And when they come to him, he prays for them. He enables them with his grace that he gives out in abundance to give us strength and encouragement. The Lord Jesus Christ is faithful. And because he's faithful, we can trust in him. We can trust in him with all the circumstances of life. We can trust in him for the promises of his holy word. And we can trust in him for the events of history. Now, I know when I say we can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the promises in his word, I can't think of any child of God who would have any trouble with that statement. Yes, right. But are you trusting in one of his promises today? Are you trusting in his promises that he gives in his holy word? He's faithful and he's given his word. If we really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is trustworthy, knowing that he's faithful, then we can come to him in all of our joys, in all of our sorrows, in all of when everything is going right, when everything is going wrong. Jesus Christ is faithful. Well, in a similar way, we like to think that's true when everything's going right. The Lord did it. Hallelujah. But as soon as something goes wrong, we're not looking for the Lord in it anymore. We're looking for God to get us out of it rather than finding God in it. Do you remember what David said when he wrote the 23rd Psalm? He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, Thou art with me. God is with me. Why? That was God's promise. He's made the same promise to us today. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has promised to be with us. And God is faithful. No matter where you are or what you're facing, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's there with you. That's why he sent forth his spirit into your heart and into his temple, the church. Because God is faithful to strengthen us, to enable us. Sometimes it's deliverance. Sometimes it's the grace of God to demonstrate so that everyone can see, I don't know how that person is bearing up. They aren't. God is upholding them through all they are going through. Why? Because Jesus is faithful. He is faithful. But ah, uh, you know what? That one, you preached that one before, Pastor. But when we get to the events of history, I'm not so sure. Have you read what's going on over in Iran, Israel? Have you read what's going on in Lebanon? Hmm. Those are troubling things, aren't they? Have you heard what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, China? How much time do you have? I suppose, in one sense, you can just kind of be an ignorant person. It's not a pretty picture. You know, the ostrich who sticks its head in the ground so they don't know what's going on around here. There are some people who live that way. They just try to ignore it. Just try to ignore it. That's one way to deal with it. But it's not a way that demonstrates the glory of God. How do you demonstrate the glory of God in the events of human history when it seems like everything is going askew and has the potential of getting much worse? I don't know if it will. I'm not a prophet in the sense of someone who's telling the future unless I'm reading the scriptures, which have a lot to say about the future, do they not? But I want to tell you this. If you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful in the affairs of human history, then you have a sense of confidence and assurance in what? Whether or not they'll attack my house or burn it down, I want to tell you there's many a believer today in different countries. We've been praying for the believers of Sudan who've had to flee their homes and run to a different country. Is the Lord Jesus Christ faithful to them? Is he with them? Amen, he is. When it comes to the events of human history, we struggle to acknowledge the sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ and that he's faithful. That's because we look at it from our own human perspective, what I like, what I want, what I think should happen, rather than realize God is moving all the events of human history like a mighty river, and he's moving them toward a particular event, and it's the return of his son, Jesus Christ. It's not a better America. I'm, I'm please, I'm not against a better America. I'm all for a better America. But I want to tell you, that's my agenda. Do you know what God's agenda is? To bring Jesus Christ back to this earth and establish a kingdom of righteousness. Do you remember what Jesus said? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
they will be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, yes. And the Lord Jesus Christ promised that he's going to receive the church, this house that he's building right now, to himself before the 70th week of Daniel, known as the Great Tribulation. God's going to call his church because it's not just his temple. He also calls it, Ephesians chapter 5, his bride. He's going to bring her home to heaven. All of these events are revealed in the word of God. And so the believer ought not to be surprised when we hear of wars and rumors of war, should we? I think I quoted that from the Bible. We shouldn't be surprised when we hear about earthquakes. These are all just the beginnings of the movings that are going to yet take place. Because God has a plan and a program. And you know what that is? To bring his son, Jesus Christ, back to earth to establish his kingdom. Wow. Wow. Now, I want to tell you, if the church could get a hold of that and proclaim the fact that God's in control and he's working in our lives today to do what? We're going to see to manifest his grace to be our strength. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to see verse 13. You know it. We're talking about the fact that Jesus is faithful in his own house, the church, the body of Christ. Just as God was faithful through Moses, his servant, in his house in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel. Notice what we read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is what? He's faithful. God is faithful because the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful in his own house. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to what? Bear it. Bear it. That's why the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are pressed on every side, but you know what? We're not crushed. Paul said we're perplexed. Sometimes Paul didn't know the next thing to do. Imagine that. Take comfort if you don't know what the next thing is to do. Paul was in that place, but Paul was not in despair. Why? He knew that Jesus Christ is on the throne in heaven, and God is working out his will and his plan. And God demonstrates his glory in our lives when we submit our will to the will of God. God here is promising strength through temptation, through trials and sufferings. And the apostle Paul experienced persecution and tremendous suffering. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ never failed Paul even once. So that Paul could say, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And I want to tell you, that's how God gets glory in his church. When we yield our will to God's will. In order to do that, we need to give the Lord Jesus Christ first place in our hearts. And when we give the Lord Jesus Christ first place in our hearts, the Spirit of God will begin to reveal to us things that we didn't even realize we put on the throne. This is more important. That's more important. This is more important. And the Holy Spirit said, nothing is more important than your Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. And if God asks us to put something aside, it needs to take second, even third, or last place so that Jesus Christ can be all in all in my heart. And when Jesus Christ has first place in my heart, as Paul wrote of, then God is going to demonstrate his glory in our lives. And he'll never let you down. Why? Because Jesus is faithful in his own house. Jesus is faithful in his own house. And he ever lives to make intercession for his children. What a privilege it is to be but a vessel that God wants to fill with his presence and power to demonstrate the glory of his son. I pray that we'll allow God to do that in a wonderful way because God said through Peter, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Jesus Christ is building his own house, and he is faithful in that house. May God help us to give Jesus Christ that place of preeminence in our heart that he may truly demonstrate the glory of his Son in our lives 
that God may accomplish the whole purpose that he wants to accomplish in us to bring glory to himself in the church by Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is truly a grand theme and an awesome thing to think about your glory. And Father, we, we confess that it's easy for us to name the words all to the glory of God, but then when we stop to think about what that means for us personally, oh Lord, help us. Help us to see anything in our heart and in our life that we would put before you. And may we, by the Spirit of God who dwells within, may we remove that item, that uh, uh, desire, that attitude. May we remove anyone or anything from first place. May we give it to Jesus Christ in our hearts. And as an assembly, that we might seek the kingdom of God and the glory of God, that you might receive the glory in your church, proclaiming the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. We give our thanks to you in his holy and blessed name. Amen.